Hi everybody, I'm glad you're joining me again where we're going to continue talking about this very important subject about not becoming dull of hearing. Uh, it's very, very important because just very frankly, if we don't hear him very well, I'm speaking of God, of course, then our relationship with him is going to suffer. And that is the source of life is being able to have a connection with our Heavenly Father. And if we're not understanding each other correctly, then we're not going to be able to receive everything that He has freely given to us. People can really get into bondage simply because they are misunderstanding God or not understanding Him at all because of the hardness of their heart. They, they've grown dull of hearing, as we will be talking about today. And one of the best parables to emphasize the importance of this, of course, is the parable of the sower. And there's so many applications to this parable, but most importantly, it emphasizes the fruit and the harvest in the kingdom of God that you can reap or not reap based on the condition of your heart. So it really, really always goes back to what is the condition of your heart? What is your, and when I say heart, we're talking about your belief system, what you understand and hold fast to as truth in your heart, in your unconscious belief system. I can say, what do you believe? And, you know, you can think for a minute and, and maybe come up with something clever, but that's not your immediate first thought. What, what I'm talking about is your kind of like your gut reaction to something. Uh, you know, as Jesus said, out of the abundance of, of your heart, the mouth speaks. So whenever God is asking you something or it, just go with what your first thought is, because that is truly what's in your heart. You really can't know your heart if you're kind of faking it out with yourself. You want to play a game, so to say, with God and, and just, you know, give up and share what is politically correct in the church realm. <laughs> An answer that, oh, hallelujah, but all the time in your heart, you're just so irate. You know, you're mad or frustrated. Be real with God. Be frank. You're doing yourself a favor by not trying to fake it with God, because after all, He knows all things, right? So... If it's quote unquote not working for you, then I expect that this teaching will really help you if you're honest. If you're honest with yourself and are having problems, then, you know, tune in and, and be real with yourself because after all, God knows all things. You're not, you're not uh, pulling the wool over God's eyes by faking it, if you are. I'm not saying that everybody out there is faking it, but, you know, there are some Christians that, you know, they want to put on the religious mask and just pretend everything's just A-OK, -okay, when all the time they're really challenged. And that doesn't help you. And that's why we're talking about this topic that isn't just all rosies and daisies. I mean, this is a really, um, can be a really tough t subject because it gets right to the heart, no pun intended, of the matter, which is what do you believe? And let's go to that parable that I just mentioned. Here in Mark 4, verse 14, Jesus explains the parable of the sower and it he says here, the sower sows the word. And by the way, as Jesus put it here in verse 13, he said, how will you understand all the parables if you don't understand this parable? 
So you could say this is the parable of all parables. You have to truly have a firm understanding of what is Jesus really emphasizing here to really grow. I mean, to even begin to grow in the kingdom of God and and your understanding of everything that's been given to you. We have to understand what really is, what is all this, this parable the sower about? Okay, so we really, you can't wear out this parable. <laughs> I mean, this is at the heart of the matter and just in many different ways applications this parable applies so here he says plainly that this parable is about sowing the word the word is at the source of all things so he's explaining how the fruition of the word comes to pass or doesn't come to pass as he says here in verse 15 are these uh, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So I'm going to pause here because this is a big point right here. You know, we're talking about essentially stony hearts. Jesus is talking about what is sown in people's hearts. What is the word that he's faithful to sow and spread by the Holy Spirit to our understanding. He is faithful, faithful. Even for people who are in bondage to Satan, you know, they still have the word sown in their hearts. And here's others here that are stony ground, or you could say hard hearts. And look at this. This is pretty amazing that even somebody with a hard heart they have the capacity to receive it with gladness. And that could probably be a surprise for some people. You know, you may think, well, man, I love the word and it just makes me so happy. And, and I mean, that doesn't necessarily rule out the fact that maybe you have a stony heart, even so. Ouch, <laughs> you know, but I mean, the good news, on the other hand, is the fact that even people with stony hearts can hear the word and immediately receive it with gladness. So that's a hopeful side of the same coin, right? So that's good news for folks that are having a tough time. God makes sure that you hear or he, he shares the word. And I'll give, I'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about hearing the word. But look at this. This is the what's revealed with somebody who has a hard heart. It's not the fact that they don't receive it with gladness, because the as these people did, they received the word with gladness. But a hard heart can be revealed by, as it says here in verse seventeen, they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. So your endurance is short. For folks that have hard hearts, it's very revealed in the fact that you're quick to give up. Oh, the word doesn't work. I've been trying it for, you know, a week, a month, a year, and it's just not working. I forget it. You know, I mean, people that don't have the endurance build up in their heart to firmly trust in the word, that is a sign of a stony heart, a hard heart. Afterward, Jesus said, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So hard hearts also are immediately, look at that, immediately they stumble. 
That that same word stumble means offended. And so a hard heart is somebody who gets offended at the word. They trip up on the word. They think, oh, it's just a waste of time. That's what you call getting offended at the word or stumbling on the word. When people belittle the power and the truth, the everlasting truth of the word, it, it will stand firm forever. It is trustworthy. You know, if you have to wait 20, 30, 40, heaven forbid, until you get caught up to heaven, the manifestation of the word, it will always come to pass. God does not lie. As we know in the word, it says that if we see it in the word, the world itself is held up by the integrity of the word. So if anybody is wrong in their understanding, it's definitely not God in his word. His word is true. So we don't ever want to just trip up on the word and get offended that it doesn't seem to be working because it is working. It's working behind the scenes. You know, whenever you sow a seed, let me pause right here or come come back to the, the camera. <laughs> whenever you sow a seed, the, the roots aren't immediately seen, right? The seed is the word and you sow it in, in your heart, let's say, as Jesus is definitely applying it here. And if you don't see that green sprout immediately, you and your, you know, I'm not saying you specifically, but a person has the capability being human to lean on their own understanding and think, oh, it's just not working. I don't see that healing. I don't see, you know, the prosperity that God promises me in the word. I don't see that peace, that sturdy, firm, everlasting peace in my heart. It's just sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. Well, don't give up. Keep sowing and watering the word that's in your heart. When I say watering, it always goes back to the word. You know, I mean, if you ever scratch in your head, what's this word mean? Well, it probably means the word. <laughs> in other words, water. Water is a type of the word. So the way you water your seed, which is the word, is with the word. You know, just think more on the word. And it it has the ability to firm up in your heart with clear understanding and and remove doubts that that it is working, it is it is true and it has already been provided. Here in the New Testament, that is a key understanding of receiving from God by the word is realizing all these promises are already yes in Christ. They're already yes and are in existence in the spirit because Jesus has finished the work. It's not kind of halfway done, you know, I mean, kind of like cooking something in the oven. Oh, well, the timer hasn't gone off yet. We have to wait a little bit longer before it's done. No, as Christians, we we want to believe, well, I should say we need to understand that all these things are already done by Christ in the spirit realm. Whatever your promise is that you're trusting in. He is faithful, faithful, faithful. I mean, you can't put enough faithfuls together to emphasize how faithful Jesus is to fulfill his word. So going back to this parable here, you don't want to get offended at the word that it's not coming to pass because you don't see anything happening on the outside because those roots are being built up under the ground, under the surface where you can't see it. 
as you are meditating and relying beyond any doubt and, you know, in a sense, sticking your heels in the ground and you're, you're just getting more and more firmed up and unflexible with the circumstances of the world that seem that are contradictory to the word because the word takes precedence over things of the world that don't line up with what the word says if anybody is a liar it's not god it's the circumstances of the world and the situations that you may face that have the capacity to lie it's not god and his word though right and so going back to that same verse again notice it says when tribulation or persecution arises see the enemy comes in these forms he gives you trouble he gives you a bad circumstance or he gives you you know people want to persecute you Oh, you're being silly. You're trusting in the word and only the word for your healing? That's ridiculous. You know, people make fun of that. They they think that's impossible. So don't be surprised that the enemy comes in that format in order to cause you to stumble at the word, to be offended at the word. And it's not because they hate you. It's because, well, we fight not flesh and blood, but principalities and rulers of the darkness. The enemy is, is Satan and his and devils that come to persecute us, not because necessarily they hate us, but they do. It's because the enemy wants to discredit the integrity of the word. It says, persecution arises for the word's sake. So whenever you're fi finding yourself in a tough spot, don't get offended and think, well, they're just giving me a hard time and it's just not fair. And, you know, the, just see things from a spiritual perspective and you'll firm up in your faith, realizing, that, oh my gosh, I really am in a spiritual war here. Because the enemy comes to get you offended at the word and comes to you, not necessarily you per se, but comes to bring bad circumstances to discredit the word, to make it seem like it's not working, right? And it always works. So realize if you're finding yourself in a tough spot, it's because it's not for you it's for the word's sake right as it says right there so going back here to verse 18 and jesus continues he says now these are the ones sown among thorns they are the ones who hear the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things entering in choke the word and it what well, where's that occur it's in your heart right and it becomes unfruitful so if you are finding yourself in a tough spot you know where the word doesn't seem to be working as it says where as jesus said right here the word's being choked off in a sense it's getting no oxygen you know whenever you prevent oxygen to something living, it's uh, su it's suffocating, it's dying, it's getting stunted. And what what is the forms of this choking that's occurring with the word in your heart? And and this really is very frequently the problem. Just this one verse right here is how we can become dull and hard to the word to seeing the fruitfulness of the word come to pass. As Jesus said right there, you get wrapped up in other cares of the world or the deceitfulness of riches. You know, you're just trusting in the dollar. Oh, the dollar is going to get me out of this fix. 
if I just had a better job, better pay, it would be so better. Or other things, just desires, not necessarily sin, but desires for other things other than God. You get distracted and, you know, maybe you like um, football. And I mean, that's you, the very little spare time that you have. That's what you spend your time doing is rather than reading the word and knowing it better, you're focused on, oh, let me watch this game. <laughs> yeah, games, I should say, you know. And and it's not that that's bad, but you're preventing the word from getting rooted in your heart because you can't just you can't just instantly have roots like a strong oak tree build up in your heart overnight. And we would love it if it were that case, you know? I mean, don't, when we all like that. But Jesus is saying the word is like a seed and it just has a growth process. And it's not because of the seed, really. It's because of the condition of our hearts that prevents it from growing in a good good rate, right? I mean, we can get our faith in the word can get diluted by the attraction and the attention that we give to other things. And it's, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, trying to step on people's toes because we live in a fast paced world and no condemnation. If you find yourself, you're wrapped up in other things. You know, God's not mad at you. This parable is to help us it's not to point the finger at us and say, see, you're really messing up here. It's to help us so that we can see where we are maybe tripping up so that we can receive all that he has freely given us, right? I mean, that's why we're talking about this because God and myself, but most especially God, he wants you to have everything that Jesus paid such a very high price to receive, to, to, for you to receive, right? I mean, the promises of God are extravagantly good. But if our hearts plugged up and stuffed up with things of this world and cares of other things, then that nothing's going to get down in there. Nothing's going to get rooted in our heart in order for the word to produce, as he said further on, verse 20, this is the good verse, <laughs> but these are the ones sown on good ground who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit, some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. All right. So isn't that good news that there is good ground where the, the fruit of the word can manifest and notice that that heart of course again we are talking about the condition of hearts that heart doesn't have more in it it has less it has less cares of the world less belief in de the deceitfulness of riches less persecution and distractions and desires for other things, you know, just it has less. So the way to see the manifestation of the word in our lives is to have um, cleared out hearts. You know, you're not trusting in other words and you have learned to hold fast to the word you don't just try it for a little while and then, oh, well, it's not working. You're not getting offended at the word. You're, you've are you gotten to a point where you say, no, God doesn't lie. And he said this promise to me. And I am not letting go of it because this is the source of my life. I'm going to see this come to pass in this world. Because God gave it to me to, in order that I would have the ability to live an abundant life here in this world. You know, God doesn't give his promises in vain. 
just because they sound cute or something. No, he, he is watching over his word to perform it. So as you, you know, stand fast in your word and the word that you are trusting in, you are, you know, building up your root system. You're growing from a little seed, a little sprout to a giant oak with a strong root system and producing lots of little acorns. You know, you are fruitful. The manifestation of the of the word is is producing in your life. And so that's how you know the condition of your heart and not becoming dull, not becoming distracted or careful about your life, you know, casting a care uh, casting aside cares that the world is wrapped up in is not what we're called to um, be burdened with for sure. I mean, that's why we have a heavenly father. He takes care of us, period. Simply put, you know, we're not to be careful about our lives. We just keep our eyes fixed on him. And in doing so, we are keeping our hearts cleaned up and free of debris and junk and, you know, just distractions so that the word, the word that we are meditating in and sticking fast to will produce a harvest, right? You don't want your work to be in vain. You know, I want to say your work. I'm talking about you meditating in the word. So don't just, you know, meditate in it for five minutes and then the rest of the day worry because you're not doing yourself any good. You might as well just not even meditate in the word at all right? There's nothing beneficial in being double-minded. And that's another synonym for being (laughs) hard-hearted. We don't want to have two different mindsets because as it says in James, you won't receive a thing. And it's not because God is mean. It's because you're moving around so much. It's like if I throw, if I'm the pitcher in a baseball game and I need to hit the bullseye. I need to go right across that plate and so that the batter can hit the ball, so that the catcher can catch the ball. It wouldn't do the catcher any good if he's just bouncing over here to this side and, oh, he can't make up his mind, so he's going to move over here. And, And I'm like, I mean, where do I throw the ball? So God's ready and he's always actually in the spiritual realm, it's all the ball, quote unquote, it's always coming to you. But the problem is, is that you're moving around. You're, you were over there and now you're over here. And, and what, I, what that is symbolically is doubts. Doubts cause you to be over here or be over there instead of being right across the plate. And being right across the plate is when you are Your heart is clear of all these distractions and cares and offenses. We're having a a heart that has less in it, so to say, and not, we don't need more, more faith. We need less junk. (laughs) We need less junk in our hearts, less, oh, doctor's reports and well, the banker says this, my, my insurance is going higher, the interest rate is increasing. Well, the news media says, man, there's no hope for our government, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, just stuff that weighs your heart down and contradicts what the word promises. You don't want to focus on those things because it's not helping you. And it's, it's preventing you the ability to receive, to see the manifestation of the word that's being planted in your heart. You got to take care like a farmer does, you know, I mean, a farmer that sows the seed in the field, he doesn't just sow it once. And then, you know, he comes back six months later and hopes something has popped up. No, he takes care of that seed. You know, he's watering it, he's fertilizing it, 
He makes sure it's not in the dark. I mean, some like a greenhouse, sometimes you have to put plants in a special container or a special house. You know, taking care of those tender seedlings and making sure they have good light. You know, I mean, being a farmer of the word, as you're sowing the seed in your heart, it takes diligence. You can't just throw it out there one day and forget about it and come back six months later and say, Pfft, where's my crop? Where's my fruit? No, you have to day in and day out and keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. And, and in doing that, you, what you're doing is you are really establishing your heart. You're establishing your belief system so they're not, you know, wishy-washy or topsy-turvy and, you know, you're changing your mind one day and the next week, well, I'm going to believe the word today. You, you have to be consistent. And it's, don't get me wrong, don't misunderstand me is what I'm saying, thinking, well, God's waiting on you to get it right, to for you to realize that you already got it. No, he, don't forget about grace. He's already given it to you. That's the, that's what keeps you going is realizing God's already given this to me. It's done in Christ. So let me spend some time to assure my heart that I already have it. You know, you're not trying to earn points with God. No, you're, you're staying in the word for your own sake, for your, for you to finally become fully convinced that the word has, you already have it. You already, it's already been done in Christ. That's where you want to get to in your heart as you meditate in the promises is becoming so fully convinced that you already have it, quote unquote, whatever that is for you. It's not so that, oh God, look at my faith. Aren't you just so impressed? Now give it to me. <laughs> you know, no, that's, that's works of the flesh. That sounds real spiritual, but that's actually what you call a dead work. You know, where you are trying to impress God to, you know, show off your faith so that you can now be given what he's promised. He, the, the, the truth of the new covenant is that you've already been given these things. And when you meditate in the promises, you are, should be convincing your own heart that you already have it. You already have been given all these wonderful things of your inheritance in Christ freely, not through your works and your personal righteousness, but because of Jesus's accomplishment alone on the cross. So let's go here also in another gospel. And in context, this is also the parable of the sower. Here in Matthew 13, verse 15, we can see how people's hearts grow dull. Also, Jesus said, For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their, ear, their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. So we can see here that people's hearts grow dull and their ears are hard of hearing. And look right here. It says, they have closed their eyes. So God, it's not that God is making things difficult to understand. It's because we allow our eyes to get shaded, so to say. Or literally, as it says right there, we close them. When we hear the truth, we don't, people that have grown dull in their understanding say, oh, well, the word, it really doesn't mean that. Or they say, oh, that's too easy. 
that can't be true. That's impossible. You know, just where you discount the word and you just turn away from it and you go another way that you in your own reasoning think is going to be the best way. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying there, that they turned, they turned away. And he said, oh, if they would only turn to me, you know, believe in me and what I've said, if they would turn to me, then I would be able to heal them. But because people are trusting in their own understanding, you know, possibly lies, philosophy of the world, religious traditions, doctrines of the devil, possibly, you know, I mean, people are trusting in other things other than the word. That's another way you can get hard hearted, of course, is you're not even simply trusting in the word at all. And maybe you've heard the word, but you've never really understood Like as Jesus said here, understand with your heart. Some people, they think the parable of the sower is just about farming. You know, I mean, they have no, they had no idea that the parable of the sower is talking about a spiritual dynamic, laws of faith in the kingdom. You know, they just kind of skipped over that and totally missed it. And that's how the Pharisees were back then. They thought that Jesus was just talking about farming. And again, remember here that he's speaking about the word. So he says in verse 16, this is for the disciples, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. And a very other similar example Here in Hebrews 3, verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will, if you will, that's a decision of your will. If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. See, God's very patient with us. He never gives up hope. You know, he kept sharing the word and sharing the word and sharing the word with those people, the Israelites in the wilderness, and yet they still wouldn't believe and trust in him. And he says, Therefore I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. You know, this is the new, this is in the New Testament. So this is pot, the the experiences of the Old Testament generations are for our learning, like the Bible says. And so we definitely do not want to do this, right? And this is just a reminder, you know, God is patient He's not short-tempered. He will patiently lead you in the way that you should go, but don't resist him. You know, they they said they would not listen to him. They hardened their hearts to hearing his voice. So we don't want to be in that same situation, right? Where we're going astray in our hearts. So I swore my wrath In verse 11, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Okay, that's quite a mouthful. But notice that God wants us. He wants us to enter his rest. The rest of knowing that he has finished the work. That your inheritance is laid up eternally and no one can steal it. It is secure in the name of Jesus for, for you. 
And that's what entering his rest is like. It's, whew, man, it's a load off your shoulders, realizing that Jesus did it all. So that's what we need to keep on hearing and not, you know, become and take on an evil heart of unbelief, you know, thinking it's now all about our efforts, because that's where it starts, is where you start thinking, oh, I need to do this, and I haven't done that, and I never get it right. You, you know, you're focused on you instead of focused on him and what he's already accomplished for you. He's already made you righteous. He's already made you healed and whole in every way in the name of Jesus. So, And when you start delving in and taking a detour into believing those lies, you are in effect departing from God. Now, I'm not talking, it's not talking here about, you know, you've lost your salvation, but it's talking about you being in unity with God in your beliefs so that you can receive from him daily, minute by minute, and and not miss out on in experiencing your inheritance here in this world. So I guess I think some people could misunderstand that little phrase departing from the living God. It's just talking about as it says in Amos, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? So that's as I said earlier when we remain in God and remain meditating upon the word then that's a good heart, a cleared out heart, a, a clear, pure heart that doesn't have doubts. And when we're abiding in the word regularly, not just, you know, checking in once a year, <laughs> heaven forbid, but, you know, you're, you're living. It says the just shall live by faith. Well, what do you do when you live? I mean, you're eating regularly. I mean, you're doing things regularly every single day. So you don't just do it once and then say, oh, well, I'm done. No, when we're dwelling in him, then we're communing with him regularly, just like you do with your friends. You know, you pick up the phone, you text them regularly, right? That's that's abiding it's, you know, that's the Christianese word, abiding, <laughs> right? So we don't, as it says here, want to be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin either. You know, that should go without saying, right? That's, I mean, most people would know that. And so I don't want to belabor that. But yeah, I mean, just sinning and and you know it says all things are possible but not all things are beneficial for us in grace so we have liberty we're not being judged when we sin because jesus took away all our sins but if you just determine almost in a sense ah eh, god doesn't care i'm gonna do whatever i want to do you know you are in a sense hardening your heart with that kind of attitude right? We don't want to just embrace sin. And so when we uh, allow our hearts to go there and stay there, you're allowing your heart to become dull of hearing God. And who wants that? You know, it, deceitfulness of sin is what that means is it promises a lot. It seems like it's going to be a really good deal. But in the end is death. As it says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. So that's the eventual outcome. And that's the deceitfulness of it. Because it seems good and, oh, it smells so good, feels so good, you know, on the outside, initially. But in the end, it's out to kill you. And, uh, you know, that's just on the surface level. I mean, I don't normally like to focus on the works of the flesh because that's just the fruit of what you've been thinking on. 
You know, it doesn't do any good to keep snipping away at the weeds on the outside. We want to get to the root of the matter, the root of the problem, and just kill it. <laughs> if it is a weed, right? We don't want to just snip away at the weeds so they grow back some more, right? We want to get down to the root of the problem. So what that's really aiming at is sin starts in our belief system. It says it says in Romans that anything that is not of faith is sin. So that pretty much just nails it. You know, we're not necessarily talking about just outward sin and living in it, but we're talking about sin literally starts at what are you believing at? Because if it's not of faith, then that's sin. You know, we've been called to the obedience of faith. And when we don't obey the faith of Jesus Christ, which means if we are not trusting in the fact that Jesus did it all, then we're not obeying the faith. Obeying means diligently listening to. That's what obeying means in the New Testament realm. Of That, that word means we are diligently listening to the faith of Jesus Christ. That's, that is the crux of of the New Testament, the New Covenant, the message of Christ is, is what is the faith of Jesus Christ. His faith delivered us, basically. And that's what we're diligently listening to. We're diligently applying our hearts to believing day in and day out. And when you focus on that, not your personal faith, but focused on what Jesus has done for you, then that is ministering wholeness to our heart. And, and we're staying in faith. We're building up our faith. Praise God so that we can see the manifestation of that word come to pass. Amen. So here is another way to become hard as we were talking about sin in 1 Corinthians 15:33 in the New Living Translation it says don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good character think carefully about what is right and stop sinning <laughs> that's pretty straightforward huh so we are being ignorant and and dull to think that we can stay influenced or I should say not influenced but that's what's happening is you are becoming influenced if you stay in the atmosphere and the attitude of unbelievers and don't guard your heart against that it's not that we are separating ourselves from unbelievers but we aren't joined up together, yoked together with unbelievers because their unbelief affects your faith. Good or bad company corrupts good morals. Or you could say your faith corrupts your faith. It's like pouring um, weed killer on a really good healthy grass. You know, your faith is just beautiful when it's not being influenced with the unbelief of others. So in a similar sense, also in 2 Corinthians 7, actually, let's go ahead and start here at the tail end of 2 Corinthians 6. This is the New Living Translation. And in verse 17, it says, Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So this, uh, I mean, again, this is 
just like I said, and with regard to 1 Corinthians 15, is we can run the risk of being influenced by unbelievers and in a sense our faith becomes filthy and contaminated by their unbelief. And if you read into the next chapter here in chapter 7, I want to read this in the Passion. The Passion Translation. It says, Beloved ones, with promises like these, and because of our deepest respect and worship of God, we must remove everything from our lives that contaminates body and spirit and continue to complete the development of holiness within us. Again, I urge you, make room for us in your hearts. So, you know, this is the word of God. And so essentially God is saying, make room in your heart for him. You know, don't be satisfied and content with becoming contaminated by the unbelief of unbelievers. That, that's what it's talking about here. When it says, remove everything from our lives that contaminates body and spirit, it's not talking about it, your spirit, um, just for the record, your spirit is always holy. You, you are a new creation because of the blood of Jesus Christ alone. And so your spirit is always righteous, always holy. And just for clarification, it is talking about the unbelief, the spiritual unbelief of others that we need to cleanse ourselves from. Because our spirits being born again does not get contaminated, but their effect from other people can challenge our faith. And, you know, this is a loose translation here. <laughs> this is passion, but it does get the point across. And in King James, to be accurate, it says, cleanse ourselves from that little preposition makes a big difference. Of course, King James is accurate to a T, and from is the correct preposition, not, not as we read in the past, Passion, right? Because from means it's outside. It's not inside your spirit, it's outside. And that that makes sense when we're talking in context of having uh, relationships with unbelievers that's negatively influencing our faith. We need to separate ourselves from them because that can, you know, contaminate our faith. And also, you know, a lot sometimes spirit isn't just you know, as we, amazingly enough, here in the Bible, because <laughs> you would think flesh and spirit, you're talking about your spirit, but it's actually talking about the attitude. You know, like you would say, oh, well, she's got great school spirit. You know, what a great, good attitude you have. Well, that's actually the context of that word spirit uniquely. I mean, it's not the typical, oh, well, this is your spiritual identity. That's talking about your attitude, your 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 attitude. I don't want to say your spirit because that just, is, that doesn't help clarify things. So when we are separating ourselves from the negative attitude and disbelieving, hardening, attitude of unbelievers, that's doing us good. That's helping us to firm up our faith and, and not delve into doubt that comes through believing and associating regularly with unbelievers. Again, we are called to be salt and light to the world, so I'm not saying let's go hide ourselves in a closet, but um, this is talking about being familiar and and associating closely with unbelievers and yoking yourselves up to their unbelief. 
And as we read earlier in 1 Corinthians, that corrupts your good character, your heart, your pure heart of faith. That can contaminate your walk of faith, contaminate and harden you to hearing his voice. It's like uh, you're trying to listen to your favorite radio station and you want to dial in right to their specific channel, but you can't make up your mind. So you're jumping over here and jumping over there. And so all you hear is scratchy sound, static, because you're going back and forth, back and forth. Well, see, that's what happens when we are want to trust fully in God and yet we got these close associations and friendships with the world that, I mean, they, they just thumb their nose at God. I'm talking about some rough characters, hard, unbelieving attitudes and spirits that can, you know, th- throw the water on your flame for a faith for God. You know, they're they're just a big downer of doubt and unbelief to your faith. And it's not healthy for your well being, it's not healthy. And that's what it's talking about here is you know, let's perfect holiness and the fear of God. And what that's talking about is we're not fearful of God. It's talking about respecting God above others. That's what fear can be. I mean, you're honoring, you're revering God above others. And I like it back to the passion here. I like how he says, again, I urge you, make room for us in your hearts so we can plug up our hearts with other things and not let God in. We've wronged no one, corrupted no one, and taken advantage of no one. I'm not saying this to condemn you. For I already told you that we carry you permanently in our hearts and you'll stay there throughout our lives for we will live together and die together with an open heart. Let me freely say how very proud I am of you and how often I boast about you. So isn't that just so sweet of God? That's how he corrects us. You know, he shows us all this, you know, Be aware, you know, I am charging you to watch your your attitude and who you are associating with. Purge yourself of this unbelief of others. And then he, you know, softens it with this grace saying, hey, I've opened my heart completely to you. My heart is for you, not against you. And that's God. You know, this is God's word. And he's saying, I'm not, you know, condemning you by any means. This is for your betterment. This is for your wholeness. It's so that you can hear me. You know, let's tune in to the right channel and not get hardened and dull of hearing by listening to other voices and associating closely with unbelievers' philosophies. You know, they have... They have philosophies that totally contradict God and his deity. You know, the Big Bang Theory and uh, versus creationism. And, you know, where the Bible clearly said God spoke, light be, and there was light. And But the world says, ah, you can't trust the word. That's ridiculous. Don't you know the world came into being by a Big Bang? You know. Well, I think that's ridiculous <laughs> to think that everything we can see was made by a bang. Anyway, I'm not taking a bunny trail off that, but it just it will contaminate and contaminate your faith and and make it harder for you to receive from God. And we don't want that, right? We want to be like little children, as Jesus said. Let the little children come to me for such. Of these is the kingdom of God. And children are simply believe. They don't say, well, I have five degrees and I graduated from high school, so I know all things. 
you know, no, little children, they're like, really? You know, they're just so easy. They easily believe they don't have big theories blocking their way to, or, and they're so carefree because they have parents that take care of them, whom they trust in. So they're not worried about all kinds of things of the world, right? They're just having fun. They're just carefree, believing in their parents. And that's, that's where we want to be, right? So that we can live carefree lives, fulfilling lives, and fruitful lives. Experiencing all that God has freely given us, right? So I'm going to pause right here for today, and we will pick up on this next time for sure. There's more to say. So you all have a wonderful week, and I thank you so much for tuning in and letting me share with you. And I pray that you were greatly encouraged. Have a great week. Bye-bye.